Today, I want to talk to you about WCAG's 13 guidelines for web accessibility. But first, hi, I'm Casey. I am a technical director at Sparkbox, and I'm also a certified professional in web accessibility. Now, web accessibility is a hot topic in our industry, and a lot of people are asking the question, how do I know if my website is accessible? Well, one way is to compare our website to a set of standards. And the standards that most people use are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. Now, WCAG is versioned, um, and the current version is 2.1. Now, the WCAG standards aren't the easiest thing to read. There's a lot of information packed into the guidelines themselves, and sometimes the text is just difficult to read. So we're going to break things down and cover the basics. And to start, we're going to talk about how WCAG is structured. There are four main principles when it comes to WCAG. These are like the concepts, these are the things that your website need to be in order to be considered accessible. It needs to be perceivable, it needs to be operable, it needs to be understandable, and it needs to be robust. The principles by themselves are kind of vague, so they're broken up into guidelines, and there are 13 guidelines total. The guidelines are then further broken into success criteria, and each guideline has its own set of success criteria, and there's 78 of them total. The success criteria are really specific use cases that you can use to test your website's accessibility. For today, though, we're just going to focus on the 13 guidelines. There's one more layer to WCAG, and that's levels of conformance. There are three levels, A, AA, and AAA. Level A is just meeting the bare minimum level of accessibility. Um, a lot of websites do this without even really trying. Level AA will include everything in level, level A and then add a few additional requirements on top. Um, this is a level that you might have to work at a little bit in order to get your website to, to match it. And then finally, there's AAA, which includes all of the above, as well as a few additional requirements. Um, and this is going to be the strictest level of accessibility. And depending on your content, sometimes it's not even possible to achieve a AAA level of conformance. When most people are talking about accessibility, they're talking about this level AA, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, you may be wondering how these levels fit in with our principles and guidelines and success criteria. Well, here's an example of guideline 1.2, um, and it has these success criteria layered beneath it. And each of the success criteria is assigned a level, level A, level AA, and so forth. So depending on the level that you want to achieve, these are the success criteria that you need to meet. If you're going for level AA, then you don't have to match the level AAA success criteria and test against them. So that was the basic structure of WCAG. Now we can talk about the 13 guidelines. Remember that the 13 guidelines are organized into the four principles. So we're going to do a quick overview of what the principle means, and then we'll get into the guidelines for that principle. And first up, we have perceivable. All of the guidelines grouped under perceivable revolve around making sure that people are able to find your content. Perceivable 1.1 requires that all non-text content has a text alternative. This means 
images need to have descriptive alternative text. Here we have a lovely photo of a cat with its face in a slice of pizza. And our alternative text reflects that. It clearly describes what is going on in this image. This also applies to our CAPTCHA images. Uh, we can't really have alt text for CAPTCHAs, um, right? It kind of defeats the purpose of having the CAPTCHA. The robots can read the alt text. So we need to provide another alternative for folks that are using assistive technology such as a screen reader. In this case, the reCAPTCHA form has an audio button that will read the words to the user so that they can then input them. The next guideline, Perceivable 1.2, requires that there are alternative options for time-based media. First example would be closed captions on video for folks that are hearing impaired. I was just thinking I, um, I want one more cookie. You do? Yeah. So in the video example, the closed captions weren't useful for just the dialogue. The music in the opening, the slamming of the door and rustling around in the cabinet, these are all things that uh, folks with hearing impairments just aren't going to pick up on, and the closed captions can help give them that context. Another way that we can make video more accessible is to add audio descriptions for folks with vision impairments. Now, these folks may be able to hear the audio, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get enough context to understand what is happening on the screen. So for this example, try closing your eyes. Uh, watch the video and, and put yourself in their shoes for a minute and see if you can guess what's happening in the video. Imagine you can't see what's happening on the screen. Uh, there's not a whole lot to go on to, to really understand. There's one little bit of dialogue at the beginning, but the rest are all just kind of grunts and noises. There's, it sounds like a dog's panting at one point. Uh, so now let's uh, watch that same clip, but this time with audio descriptions layered in. From the creators of Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed coaline snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh, hello. <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. <gasps> His nose lands on a frozen pond. A reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. <gasps> Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him. Though actually, he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. 
The snowman uses his arm as a crutch. The reindeer paddles his front legs. Head over heels, the snowman crawls along the ice. The reindeer does the breaststroke. The snowman rolls his body, but flips onto his back. The reindeer's tongue sticks to the ice. So you could see how, or in this case here, how audio descriptions add an extra layer of context, like storytelling for folks that just cannot see what's happening on the screen. Something else that we can do for time-based media is to provide a transcript. You can find examples of transcripts on many podcast websites, um, such as the website for This American Life. Um, they have a button, and as you click that, it takes you to a page that has the entire podcast um, written out um, as if it were a script. Next, we have Perceivable 1.3, which requires that content can be presented in different ways without losing context. An example of this would be to make the same content available for all different screen sizes. Um, it's okay to hide things on small screens as long as you can still get to them, right? We have the navigation collapsed. Um, at mobile into a mobile nav that's accessed via the button. Um, but we don't want to make any of the content completely inaccessible. We also don't want to lock users into a certain screen orientation. Um, we want to let them be free to rotate their devices. We also want to make sure that websites are going to work with tools such as Safari Reader Mode. Having the proper heading structure is going to make sure that the right content is displayed on the screen um, so that the rest of the clutter on the page can be removed. This is a tweet from Kevin Jones. He is a screen reader user and he relies on Safari Reader Mode to get rid of the extra clutter on the page so that he can focus on the content that is important to him. And the last guideline for Perceivable is Perceivable 1.4, and it requires that content can be separated from its background. An easy way to do this is to have sufficient contrast between text and its background color. So black text on a white background is going to have the highest level of contrast. It's easy to see. Whereas a really light gray text on a white background has a really low contrast ratio. And this is hard for anyone to read. We want our text to have a minimum contrast ratio of 4.5. Um, now, large text can have a, a lower contrast ratio of 3, but for normal, for most text on the page, we need that 4.5 uh, minimum ratio. Distinguishability doesn't apply to just the visual components of a website. It affects audio as well. Uh, background audio and music should be 20 decibels quieter than speaking voices. Next up are the guidelines that make sure your website is operable. People must be able to use your website. The first operable guideline, 2.1, requires that all parts of a website can be accessed using only a keyboard. In this example, we have accordion where some content is hidden and then we can click a button to access that content. Um, the toggle element of this accordion needs to also be keyboard accessible. So let's jump to the code real quick. And we have an accordion. You can see we can click and expand it. And we can also tab and then press enter. 
press the space bar to expand and then tab to the next accordion item. Uh, in order to accomplish this, over in the code, we have a button element. Um, by default, the button element is keyboard accessible. We can tap to it, um, we can press enter, return, spacebar, um, and interact with that button. And we don't really have to write any extra JavaScript uh, in order to do that. If we were to replace that button with a div, so now we have a div instead, um, we can still click the element and expand it, but when I try to tab on the page, I'm unable to tab to the accordion. So using the button makes sure that this interactive component is now keyboard accessible. While we're talking about buttons, we should also talk about links. Um, they can seem kind of similar, right? We can tap to them, we can click on them, interact with them, and they do things. Um, but they are two different elements and they have two different purposes. Um, you want to use a link when you're linking to content somewhere else on the internet. And you want to use a button when you want to like perform some sort of an action. Operable 2.2 requires that people are given enough time to use the content on your website. Going back to our video examples, um, you can't just play video on a page without giving the user control over the video. They have to be able to pause and start the video on their own. This doesn't apply to just video, but any animation or video that lasts more than five seconds has to have some sort of start and stop control as well. Here we have an animated GIF that will just keep looping continuously, um, and that can be really distracting for some users, but we have a control, and then now they can pause and start the animation as they want. If for any reason there's a time limit on a certain action, such as in this Eventbrite form, um, you have to give the user a reasonable time to finish the task without feeling rushed. Uh, you also need to consider that different people have different abilities, and some may be a little bit slower in filling out the form. Take, for example, a person with a mobility disorder and that relies on a mouth stick in order to type. They're not going to be able to complete the form at the same pace as a person who doesn't have that requirement. Some information may be time sensitive, um, such as a banking website that requires a user to be logged out after a certain period of inactivity. Uh, well, you can't just log users out without warning. You do have to give them some sort of a notice and a chance to cancel the logout. Next, we have Operable 2.3. This guideline requires that content is not designed in a way that will cause seizures. Animations and video should not flash more than three times per second. The most famous example of why we have this requirement would be an episode of Pokemon, which aired in Japan in 1997. Uh, there was a scene with such like intense flashing imagery that it caused seizures in almost 700 children. So we definitely want to avoid that. Operable 2.4 requires that people can navigate the website and understand where they are in the website. So let's look at an example. This is a screenshot of the WebAIM website, and we have... Uh, somebody is tabbing through all of the links and inputs and buttons on the page and as they're tabbing there is a focus state so that they know where they are on the website as they are working their way through the content. Now this isn't the only way that WebAIM is making sure that people know where they are at. They also have unique titles for each of their page. So we know we are on the keyboard accessibility page. They have breadcrumb navigation, 
we know that we're on the keyboard accessibility page, which is nested in the article section, which is nested under the home page. And then they have a table of contents for this particular section. There's uh, links to content later on in the page for keyboard accessibility. And then we also know what content is coming up on the next pages. And then finally, uh, for Operable, we have Operable 2.5, which requires all parts of a website can be accessed using other input devices besides a keyboard. We've talked a lot about keyboard accessibility so far, but we also need to make sure that websites work with a mouse, touchscreen devices, and assistive technology such as speech to text. Here we have an example from dcmp.org. Um, they have an interface where users can rearrange video clips and they have a drag and drop feature that will work with a mouse and with touchscreen devices. And then they also have buttons um, to move a clip up and down that will work with a keyboard or also a mouse or touchscreen device. So there's plenty of options to rearrange these video clips um, in an accessible way. The third principle, understandable, ensures that people are able to understand your website. Understandable 3.1 requires that content is readable and easy to understand. One way that we can do this is by using simple language and avoiding jargon whenever possible. If you do need to use technical terms or industry specific terms, then define them in the text. When we add the title attribute to the abbreviation tag, we can add the definition or the entire phrase. Um, so as you can see, we have the acronym NASA, and then a title tag that says National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And then right below it, we have the word abbreviation abbreviated, um, and then our title tag gives the entire word abbreviation. When a mouse user, um, hovers over the text, they will get the definition in a little pop-up, um, but also screen reader users. The screen reader will uh, read the title to the user, um, so they will also get the definition. All web pages should have an HTML element with a lang attribute specified. The lang attribute should tell um, assistive technology, what language the page is written in. So in this case, we have a page that is written in English. Sometimes you may have a page that is written in English, but has phrases from other languages in the text. Um, we can improve accessibility by wrapping those phrases um, or words in a span tag and then setting the lang attribute on the span tag. Um, we have two examples here. Um, the first one has a French phrase that we're not doing anything with. And the second one, we actually specify that, hey, this French phrase is written in French. Press control, option, shift, down arrow. In code pen, using the lang attribute web content, this is how voiceover reads a French phrase when it thinks the page is entirely written in English. Pouvez vous parler plus lentement, as il vous played. Here is how voiceover can read in English but switch to French. Pouvez vous parler plus lentement, s'il vous plaît. You are currently on the text element, inside of web content. To exit this web area, press control up voiceover off. So notice as the screen reader is reading um, the first sentence, it tries to pronounce the French phrase in English and it sounds uh, rather ridiculous. Um, but in the second, the screen reader switches. It reads in a French accent with French pronunciation and the correct inflection on words. Understandable 3.2 requires that web pages are predictable in how they appear and operate. Here we have a Smashing Magazine article. Um, when you go to different articles, of course the content um, is going to be different, but the main structure of the page remains the same. Our navigation is always in the same spot. 
The order of the links doesn't change. Uh, the topics search button um, is always in the same place. The author information is also in the same place as well. It's always to the left of the content there. The article information is also always in the same spot. Um, if these things jumped around from article to article, um, it'd be very jarring for whoever's viewing the page. Understandable 3.3 requires that it is easy for people to correct and avoid mistakes. Here we have an example of an input. The input is clearly labeled. Uh, the user knows that it is expecting an expiration date. And there's also some helper text below the input that lets the user know how the date should be formatted. This is going to help them avoid making mistakes. If a mistake is made, then the user has the option to correct the mistake. Um, the field that has the error is clearly marked. Um, we're using the color red for the text and the border to signify that there's an error. But you can't just use color alone. We also have a new label that says this is an error. And we have helper text that explains how to fix the error. And the last principle, robust, ensures that your website is going to work with different technologies. There is only one guideline under robust, and that is 4.1, and it requires that websites work with current and future assistive technology. Now, we can't predict what those future technologies are going to be, but we can future proof our code. Uh, by writing valid semantic HTML. The rules for writing semantic HTML are going to be the same for every website. And as new assistive technologies are being built, they are going to be built with those rules in mind. We can also use ARIA to extend our HTML. Notice the emphasis on the word extend. Um, we should be using semantic HTML as much as possible. And if for some reason after that, uh, the website still needs some accessibility help, then we can layer in ARIA as needed. Usually when you have interactive components, like the accordion we showed earlier, um, that's when you're going to need to add in some ARIA attributes. And lastly, you want to incorporate accessibility testing into your build process. Come up with a basic checklist of things to look for as you're building. Um, you can use automated testing tools. You can tap through the pages to test for keyboard accessibility, and maybe even learn some screen reader basics to run through the pages. These are going to help catch a lot of accessibility errors before they ever make it into production. Keep in mind, however, that the average developer is not going to be a screen reader pro. Uh, so really, you should be getting your website into the hands of folks that use screen readers every day to properly test. All right, we made it through all of the guidelines. I hope you aren't feeling like this guy here. Um, this is how I felt when I first started studying the WCAG guidelines. Uh, I was studying for one of my certification exams, and to help myself and my coworkers prepare, we shared a single guideline each day with the rest of our team over the course of 13 days. We included a small overview of what each guideline requires. We gave examples of what implementing the guideline looked like. Um, it looked a lot like what I just shared with you today. Eventually, this turned into a side project called the 13 Days of Accessibility. With this project, I wanted to create a resource where anyone can find a quick overview of each guideline its success criteria, and to know which success criteria are required for each level of conformance without becoming overwhelmed. You can find this resource at a11ycalendar.caseybond.com. I hope you found this talk informative, and I hope that when you go to research the WCAG guidelines now, they're less intimidating. Thank you.